about grassland and paddock maintenance with special references to small blocks and to horses. We get quite a few queries about this uh, from people who are looking to re-sow their paddocks or are considering how best to look after their paddocks. As I'm sure you'll all appreciate, we've all seen smaller or horse properties which are very deep in weeds and uh, very little nutritional value. One of the reasons this is so important nowadays is because grassland really is, well, owning grassland really is probably the most expensive part of having your own horse, whether you're owning it or whether you're renting it, because the price of land in New Zealand is now so high. So you have to think about your paddock as being a main source of nutrition for your animals and accordingly keep them in good condition, keep them properly fertilized and maintained so that you're maximizing what you're getting from that grassland. So in New Zealand we're very lucky because the majority of horses can be kept out of grass all the year round. Now this is obviously psychologically very important for the horses. It also means that it, it, it means that there's less work for riders to do. Um, I'm originally from Britain and my horses used to be in for six months of the year because of the cold conditions and that creates an awful lot of work and a lot more expense. But we do have issues with how the grassland has uh, evolved over time in New Zealand. Obviously originally New Zealand was all covered in native bush. The fields and the paddocks that we see nowadays are something that humans have constructed for farming and animal purposes. As such, although the sheep farming predominated uh, up until quite recently, most of the pasture has been re-sown for the dairy industry. This is particularly a problem when parts of dairy farms are cut off for lifestyle blocks and people start keeping their horses and other animals on these, on these long-term rye clover pastures. Now these pastures are not very suitable for horses. They're very high in sugar, they're very high in protein, and they may also contain the endophytes, which are the fungi that cause staggers. Now I'm going to talk about staggers in more detail later on, but essentially there's a good reason for the endophyte to be included in the rye grasses in New Zealand. This is because in the upper part of the North Island, where historically most of the dairy farming was done, it's only really in the last decade or so that it's spread massively further south, there's a lot of problems with insects damaging the growing grass. The endophyte toxin that is included in that grass acts as an insecticide killing the insect. However, unfortunately, it also has a major problem in the animals that are grazing it, but more on that later on. So other things to consider about your grassland that we will talk about this evening is fertilizer, care of your soil, poisonous plants, and the consequences of bad management. If we're looking in general about grassland management, first of all, you need to keep your, your paddock nice and clean, whether you do that through harrowing and putting that organic matter from fecal manure back into the soil, or you remove the manure. This is important because it prevents the, uh, the buildup of certain lump areas where high protein grasses will develop. So you see it a lot in dairy pastures where urine patches um, form almost pillows of grass and that's in response to the high level of nitrogen that is coming out of dairy cows and not being fed a balanced diet. On the issue of removal of manure, a lot of horse owners manually remove manure as though they were mucking out a stable. One of the things to remember with this is that you are then causing a net removal of fertilizing and organic matter from that pasture. If you are removing your manure, then you do need to be extra careful with maintaining fertilizer treatment on that because you are net taking out from the system rather than putting anything back in at all. When you are looking at grassland management, the analysis of your soil and also you can analyze what's in your grass, uh, it is important to assess what fertilizer you need. Just buying a bag of general fertilizer is not really going to address the balances in the soil. You have to remember 
that the grass that you grow is only going to be as good as the soil it's grown in, because that is where it derives its nutrients from. So if you are in contact with a, um, with, uh, a fertilizer company, they can often help you with that, and I've got some details of, uh, of how you can do that better. I always look at a holistic approach to grassland and paddock maintenance, which involves the soil chemistry. Is it compacted from overstocking, which will affect things like the drainage? What organic matter or topsoil does it have? What pH it has? And the minerals as well, because once you've got that right, then you're going to get as good a grass as you can grow. We want to look at New Zealand soil specifically. We have a huge variety of different soil types in New Zealand. And within many regions, there are specific deficiencies, such as on the pumice up at Taupo, where there is a problem with the cobalt, which is why that area was sown with trees originally, because animals who tried to graze up there suffered major mineral imbalances and did not and failed to thrive or die. In many areas in New Zealand, the volcanic nature of the island has dictated how those soils are formed. Although in many places, such as where I live in the Manawatu, we have good clay uh, soils, clay bases, base soils, with good levels of nice loam over the top. So thinking about the fact that the soil quality dictates the quality of the plant material that you get off that soil, you need to be very, very specific in how you are looking at applying fertilizer. As a broad average, Fertilizer inputs in New Zealand are low compared to other countries. However, that is slightly misleading. It typically reflects the fact that fertilizer is dolloped on in one go once a year by many farmers. It also does not take into account the broad spectrum of fertilizer material that is needed. So there's the classic PKN fertilizer that is used which is phosphorus, potassium, and nitrogen, along with lime. And this is sourced very cheaply. It's in an inorganic form. And a lot of farmers use those, as well as small block owners. That does not address all the other minerals or the pH balance that is required. For people who are lucky enough to live in pre-draining soil, well, I suppose this is highlighting the fact that there's no perfect soil out there, especially for heavy animals like horses. Pre-draining sandy soils or pumices, they are good for in terms of riding and in terms of hoof care because they stay a lot drier all year round. However, they have a very high level of what is called leaching. This means that the fertilizer that is put on that soil tends to drop through into the lower la layers and may not be available for grass growth. The opposite is a very heavy colloidal clay soil with no topsoil at all. These soils have a lot of charged particles in them that will attract and attach to the inorganic minerals that you're applying as the fertilizer, which is a process called entrapment, and it makes those minerals less available to the, to the plant to grow. So if you're on a heavy clay soil, you need to look at liming, you need to look at pH, and you need to look at some pasture improvements, maybe by using a fermented tea liquid fertilizer to encourage topsoil, which will then help to reduce that colloidal clay and break it up, releasing those minerals. So if we had an ideal pasture we were thinking about, specifically for horses or heavy animals on smaller acreages, we'd be looking for good drainage, but we also want summer safe. Because if we have a very free draining soil, then it's far more drought um, prone. And we see this over in places like Hawke's Bay, in parts of the Canterbury Plains. And those are soils that are typically over gravel beds where when, once the rainfall ceases, there is very little to, for the grass to actually utilize. Another area to consider for horses and for ruminants is high fiber grasses. Both of these animal types are adapted to utilize the fiber in the grass for their correct digestive functions. In any animals, the endophyte problem has become a major issue. So when you're selecting pastures, do try and get a non-endophyte variety. 
you can still get rye grasses that have no endophytes in them, but there's a whole host of other types of grassland species that you can use. It doesn't look as pretty as rye grass and clover mixtures, but for the animals, it's far better for them. Regular topping and harrowing is important. Um, this helps break up any of the fecal material through harrowing and distributes it evenly, putting some organic matter back in the soil. The exposure of the fecal material to UV, which is obviously very strong here in New Zealand, will help kill off the parasites as well to a certain degree. That doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't still be doing your fecal egg counts to make sure that your animals are healthy. Topping either mechanically or following around behind horses with uh, ruminants that graze at different levels from horses is important. I'm sure you've all seen if you leave a horse in a paddock for any length of time, it will preferentially eat the young grass coming through and leave some of the older woodier patches. So you end up with what's called roughs and lawns. You don't want these. You want to have it so that it, the grass is all growing at about the same rate. Now, you can use cattle, and you can use sheep as well, or goats that are very good at nibbling down those other patches that the horses don't want to eat. And you have to have the good mineral and nitrogen balance to ensure that you've got that expressed in the grasses as they're growing. Common problems with horse pastures include poisonous plant infestations. Horses are terrible for this because they tend to be heavy with small feet, and this causes breaks in the sward, in the cover of the grass, which means there are open patches of bare soil that weeds are very, very fast to, to colonize. In other areas, there are unsuitable pasture species. We've already talked about things like ryegrass, but there are other, other types of grassland that have been planted for a very specific reason for their growth and the conditions that in those geographical regions but are not necessarily very um, good for horses. High sugar and protein. As we all know, who any of us who are riders, if you give horses lots of sugar, they act like toddlers in the sweet shop, and you get all kinds of tantrums that we would all like to avoid. Low fiber grasses. Again, this can cause subclinical levels of diarrhea and colic. Poor mineral nutrition from the grassland will lead to all kinds of deficiency syndromes which will build up over time. Poor sick pastures with no maintenance at all. To be honest, there's no point in turning a horse out on this. If it's all docks and thistles, they're not going to get any nutrition from it. In addition, if they haven't got adequate grass or something else to eat, they will very often turn to eating these non-nutritious plants and causing themselves other problems. A lot of people also do not use any kind of fertilizer that's adequate, and they do not really even test what their soils are to know what will be the best to put on. I want to just look now at uh, specifics of dairy rye clover mix. These are too low in fiber for horses, which causes poor fermentation in the hindgut. Now, that fermentation is the number one energy production system that horses have evolved to utilize. It can also lead to acidosis and bacterial imbalances. And these two things go hand in hand and can lead to colic or permanent subclinical diarrhea. High protein can increase the microbial levels in the foregut. And if it is not correctly digested, it will cause bacterial imbalances again. The level of soluble carbohydrates, this is sugars, these are linked to various problems. But in addition to acidosis and colic, these are also the main problem associated with laminitis. This is a specific carbohydrate in grass called fructan, which researchers in Australia have shown is the main driver for causing laminitis, not just in horses, but in all species. And then we have mycotoxicosis. The most common one for that is the equine staggers that many people are now familiar with. But there are a lot of other different mycotoxicoses as well from fungal contamination, which we'll go through in detail shortly. So if we want to optimize things, we're looking at high fiber. Ideally, we want a mixture of species to achieve high fiber. That means that the plant is producing a seed head from early spring 
through through late autumn in the different plant species. This is a good biological way to minimize the sugar because it dilutes the sugar out. Fiber and sugar ratios in plants are directly inversely proportional to each other. That means if you've got a lot of sugar, you haven't got a lot of fiber. If you've got a lot of fiber, that fiber has been constructed from that basic sugar, so the sugar levels are low. So I, when I was fertilizing and sorting out my pastures in New Zealand, the seed mix that I use is, um, has early, mid, and late heading varieties. So within biological boundaries, I can maximize the fiber and minimize the sugar. This still means that during certain climatic events, if we have a very warm, wet spring following no growth over winter, you will still get lush growth. But within the biological parameters of the plant species used, that's the aim, is to dilute out that sugar and maximize the fiber. Maintaining good cover in paddocks is an important thing. After a horrible wet winter, like we've just had here in the Manawatu, um, once the ground is suitable that you can get on it, it's really important to re-sow any bare patches to out-compete the weeds that are going to be in the soil anyway. And again, thinking about cycling around paddocks with other animals to keep the grass board in good health. So if you're wanting to look at your soil quality, it's, you can actually get soils tested pretty easily. A lot of fertilizer companies offer this as a free of charge or a small charge service. And then they can match what you need against what they can produce. So you're only putting on your paddocks what you actually need in the soil, and you're not overdosing where you don't need to. Hills Laboratories, who are independent testers in New Zealand, they will send you out a soil kit. It's less, very less than $100. I think it's about $70 to get your soils tested. And they send out little bags and instructions. And they have a very nice analysis sheet that comes back. With, um, with lines on it to show what areas are deficient, what minerals are in excess, and then you can use this with your local fertilizer company to devise what you need to get the balance back in your soil. You can use either inorganic mineral fertilizers or organic mineral fertilizers. The choice is up to you. The inorganic ones uh, will not necessarily help with topsoil and putting organic matter in where you've got poor topsoil. Uh, so it's really up to you which way you want to go. If you've got good topsoil, then those inorganic ones, as long as they're correctly balanced and suitable for your soil, that is fine. You also must remember with inorganic fertilizers, your pH has to be correct. If your pH of your soil, that's the acidity of your soil as it's measured, is incorrect, then once those inorganic minerals go into that system, they can change what their electrical state is and they can become unavailable to the plant. So you don't have to just worry about putting the minerals on. You need to make sure that your pH is right as well. Control of weeds would include broadleaf spraying in the spring. Best to spray weeds as they're initially emerging because that's when they're at their most vulnerable. And once they get to the woody stage, it's a lot harder to kill them off. And also, that helps a great deal because you don't want weed seeds in your hay or your baleage. Because when you put that out in the winter, you're scattering those seeds and increasing the potential weed burden on your pasture. So I just want to take a look now at poisonous plants that are commonly found in paddocks. One of them I'm sure you're all familiar with is ragwort. This is a tall, yellow flowering plant. It contains liver toxic alkaloids. Now, the nasty thing about ragwort is that those toxins build up in the liver over a long period of time and can actually occur in an animal just dropping dead some years after they, they started consuming it. It's very dangerous and is most likely to be consumed if it's contaminating hay or silage. When the plant's growing fresh, it's got a very bitter taste, so a lot of animals won't eat it. But that is lost when it's, when it's in filed or it's dried out. So do be aware, when you're buying hay or baleage, always ask if it's ragwort free. That's really important. If you're pulling up ragwort in your paddock, always, always wear gloves. The toxic alkaloid is in the stem, 
And as you pull it out, as that liquid is from the stem, that fluid is released, it will be absorbed through your skin and go straight to your liver. And certainly don't ever let children pull it up by hand without wearing gloves. Paspalin is one, another one that uh, is a plant that harbors a very nasty uh, fungal toxin. The fungus called claviceps, it grows on the seed heads when the plant is matured. And it, these, these are like sooty, they look like sooty black seed heads. Now, this fungus produces a toxin which is very akin to LSD. In fact, the uh, causative comp component is something called ergotamine, which causes ergotism. Ergotamine is the precursor for LSD, which is why a lot of animals will go through a very freaky experience and can become very dangerous if they consume it. It's also very tasty for horses. They will make a beeline for it to eat it preferentially out of the paddock, so do be careful if you've got any. And this was first seen in, um, in humans as well, where, they, uh, where the ergot fungus uh, was, in, was from a very damp harvest in France uh, back in the 14th century, which was a pretty awful time for growing anything because of the terrible weather. Uh, nobody in the village had anything else to eat, so they ate. The, uh, they ate the corn that had been infected with this fungus and all died of convulsion. So it's a nasty thing. So just do be aware if you see anything with sooty seed heads. These are just some photographs in cattle of what ergotism does. You can see on these photographs, you can see that the tail has been constricted and actually the end of the tail has died off. In the bottom right, you can see where there are massive lesions on the feet. And on the bottom left, you can see where the ears have actually dropped off. It affects all the extremities of the animal to the point whereby they will rot and drop off. So this is quite a nasty, nasty toxin if your animals are ever affected, which hopefully they never will be. Now, kikuyu grass is sown a great deal in Northland. And this is because of the tropical conditions in, in those areas. Kikuyu grass originally came from Africa, as the name implies. And it's used in um, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa, and parts of South America where it's growing under more tropical conditions. It's very like an elongated cooch grass, and it will grow in sandy and coastal areas, which is why it's often being deliberately sown there. However, it contains saponins and oxalates. Now, these saponins are soap compounds. And it's thought that these interfere with the membranes of the essential bacteria in the hindgut of the animal, which will unbalance those important populations. The oxalates bind calcium. And in Northland and north of Auckland, I've seen quite a few cases where the animal has been calcium deprived for a long time. And they then start to rely heavily on their bone reserves for calcium, leading to soft spots. And these are normally first seen where the bones of the skull join together at the front of the face, and it gets soft, and you can push it in and out in bad cases. So if you've got kikuyu grass, you do need to eat a balanced diet, and you do need to take care to make sure that the calcium needs of the animals are needed, um, are met. Sorry. The symptoms of the problems with kikuyu grass are that it stimulates artificial drinking. Horses need to stand by the water trough and drink and drink and drink and drink, which can be dangerous. It causes colic, it causes problems with, uh, with their fecal production, and this could be, again, because of the soapy compounds interfering with the bacteria that are necessary for the correct function of the gut. Buttercup contains a toxin called ranunculin. This causes irritation of the mouth and colic as well. And it, basically, it irritates a lot of the smooth muscle and the linings of, of the digestive tract. It's very dangerous when it's fresh. So it's, kind of, it's the opposite of the ragwort. It's dangerous when it's fresh. And it can also take over a whole paddock. So it's important that this is controlled. When it is dry, it is not toxic. It loses its toxicity. So you don't have to worry about this in hay and silage. But you do when it's fresh. And when animals have got insufficient grass, they will start to eat the buttercup to keep themselves full. In sandy soils, lupins grow very well. They have toxic seeds, and this is because of the tannin level. Now, the white lupin is not toxic. That has low tannin, 
that the yellow and the purple varieties do. And this tanning causes respiratory paralysis. It also has some funguses that it can harbor, which again exude toxins, um, which are associated with the white lupin as well. So even if you've got white lupin, that fungus, if it contaminates the plant, will cause liver damage. Penny royal is seen in a lot of horse paddocks that aren't maintained very well. It has a high, very highly toxic oil in it. And it, you see it throughout New Zealand. Uh, this again is, is part of the plant's defense against insects. But the oil itself produces, uh, is, is toxic for the liver. And it also has a neurotoxic effect, which means that it causes bladder like problems and behavioral problems in the animals. Penny royal has been used in human uh, traditional medicine for a very long time for causing abortion and all, all kinds of various issues. Um, it has actually been used to kill people in the past as well. <laughs> but not, not that I'm suggesting that, um, that it is do, that the people use that for <laughs> purpose anymore. Now, clover. People think clover's great and they like red clover hay and that's all good. Clover, white clover, contains an estrogen analogue. This means that it can interfere with conception in mares. If you have a lot of clover, um, if you have a lot of clover in your horse's diet, then you do need to be very careful what the estrogen levels are in that because you could effectively be keeping your horses on the contraceptive pill. These analogues, they might be fungal in origin. Nobody really knows, but there is certainly one area where we do know that fungal contamination, specifically of clover, causes a real problem, and that's in producing a disease called slobbered from the slacamine toxin. Um, if you are cutting clover hay and there are any black fungal patches because of inadequate turning, be very careful and I would not feed it. The symptoms of this, and I've got some a picture here, the symptoms are the animal loses control of water, of the water content of its body. So it, it will have tears down its face, it will slobber from the mouth, it will have uncontrolled urination, and of course then dehydration will come in to that to cause some major, major health issues. If you want to look at the endophytes, we've already talked about this uh, generally in terms of its uh, nutri nutritional compound and the problem with the fructan sugars. Now, the actual toxins that are associated with the endophyte is called lolitrem. Now, it's that lolitrem that causes staggers in horses and other animals. The fungal toxin grows at the base of the plant. This means that uh, it is at its most dangerous when the horses are close grazing, very close to the ground. They will have a higher intake of the toxin. If you have um, a drought, uh, on this type of grassland, then the, the, the mold that is producing the toxin goes into overdrive and overexpresses the toxin as a result of its own physiological stress. This is followed by high rainfall, then the plant suddenly uh, goes into overdrive and growth. That toxin can shoot up the whole leaf of the plant as it emerges again. So do be careful with close grazing on endophyte ryegrass. Fescue can contain uh, an endophyte, another fungal toxin. However, this is harder to see because it grows between the plant cells. And it is associated with the wild type tall fescues you see growing on grass verges. This, this fungus is actually working in synergy with the grass to, to make it hardier. So it has an advantage for the plant, but not for animals grazing it. The symptoms include loss of body heat control, um, problems with lactation, poor appetite, and it has a major, major impact of foaling in mares. This is what the endophyte fungus looks like inside the plant cell. So the purple, strong purple lines that you can see, that's the fungus. So there is no outside visibility at all that is contaminated, but you do need to be very, very careful about not using wild type natural naturally occurring tall fungus in any kind of feed for your horses. So for those of you who are grazing verges, be careful on that. This is what the, the uh, fescue endophyte does to the brain. 
it destroys the white matter in the brain, hence the behavioral problems and the degeneration in, in functioning that the animals have and the loss of control of essential metabolic systems such as controlling heat. Oh, sorry, just on one thing with that, with the fescue, fescue exposure in pregnant mares will affect the placenta and how the placenta grows. It makes the placenta very large and very tough, and that placenta typically then grows across the cervix, so you have what's known as a red bag delivery. So any of you who are breathing, when your mare goes down and starts to foal in the second stage of foaling, when the foal is actually emerging, if you see a big red rubbery membrane come out, not the white membrane around the feet, you need to get a pair of scissors and cut through that as soon as possible because otherwise you're likely to lose the mare and the foal. So one of the questions I'm commonly asked about is equine staggers. So what are the main problems? Well, most horse owners see it as behavioral problems. It causes loss of coordination and clumsiness. Now this might not just be due to ryegrass endophytes. It is seen in a lot of fungal toxins. Problems with reproduction. Um, the other problem with mycotoxins is that they are very highly oxidative inside the cells and the tissues of the body. Now, oxidation is what kills everybody. It doesn't kill you particularly quickly, but aging and cellular damage is very stressful to the whole organism. It can shorten the lifetime of an animal significantly. You may also see loss of weight and muscle mass. The oxidative uh, stresses that the toxins produce will reduce the immune system. So you may end up with an animal that's constantly sort of sick, but not really, or struggles to recover from a wound or illnesses. And the liver is the main sorting house once the, these toxic compounds have been absorbed in the blood. So they lodge in the liver, and they can cause liver failure over if, if the ingestion of toxins is over a long period of time. Our feed as well has, can contain toxins, such as fusarium from contaminated grain, especially maize. This causes those brain problems that we saw earlier that are very similar to the, the problems you saw with the fescue. But again, they cause muscle tremors, poor coordination, loss of swallowing reflex, and the biggest problem is over long-term feeding, they will cause brain damage. So always make sure that you never, ever feed moldy hard feed, especially if it's moldy corn. Any moldy feed that you have, don't feed to any animals. Just put it on the bonfire. So mycotoxins in mares, various ones affect them, not just the fescue, and the, which causes the red bag delivery. You can get reduced milk production from mares that have been exposed to various toxins from grass and from feed. The, in addition, you can, with the red bag delivery, the problems that we know about and are well characterized, you can have small weak folds which have increased risk of sepsis or infections and do not have very good prognosis for surviving and thriving. And this is a picture here of the red bag delivery. So all of you breeders, if you see that, get your scissors out really quick because it's an emergency situation. So what do you do to prevent mycotoxicosis? Well, don't allow horses access to areas that you know are contaminated, especially the past pollen, because you can readily see that when the seed head matures in the autumn. If you can, re-sow your paddocks with non-endophyte species. Most of well, all of the good horse feed companies who are producing compound feed will include a mycotoxin binder with broad activity range in their feed. You can also buy mineral buckets for use in paddocks that have some mycotoxin binders in them. So just to wrap up, um, which we're pretty good on time, good grass and good paddocks only come from good soil and correct management. And horse paddocks, because of the weight of the animal, the weeds are a huge problem to keep on top of. And you do need to have some kind of regular maintenance program that you're applying. So in October, it's weed spraying, for example. Um, you might want to put fertilizer on twice a year, depending on 
what your fertilizer company is recommending. Take soil tests. You can take tests of the actual grass as well and have it analyzed to see what's in it. You need to be aware of toxic and you have to control those. And if you can, use horse friendly grasses to try and maximize 